Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we'll be talking about diet and nutrition and how what you eat affects your life. My guest is Emily Haynes. Emily is a faculty member in the Department of Family and Consumer Science. Welcome, Emily, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you. It's great to be here. Let's start with the big question. Okay. There's an old adage that's been around for years that says something like this, you are what you eat. Is that true in the larger scheme of things? Sure, I think in the, the big picture it absolutely is. Uh, all of the things that we put into our bodies are supposed to nourish it, uh, fuel, fuel all of the activities we do each day, and hopefully uh, help us stay healthy and you know, live long lives. And I think maybe what gets lost in the translation with all the talk about diets and nutrition and so on is the fact that nutrition is there to fuel the body and to give us the energy that we need to accomplish whatever tasks is tasks are, I should say, that we need to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all of the energy we need to live throughout the day and then rebuild cells and, you know, right, there's a lot of science behind it. Okay, well, let's talk about some issues that have been in the news a lot lately, and those have to do with obesity and the so-called obesity problem in the United States. Mm -hmm. What about that? Do we have a serious problem with obesity, and if so, what does that mean? Absolutely. Um, at this point, we know that more than 50% of our population in the United States is overweight or obese. And what that means is that we have high risk levels for diabetes, heart disease, renal disease. So what that means is that greater than 50% of our population is at risk for being very unhealthy. And of course, uh, the subject of childhood obesity has taken on additional prominence with the current administration. I know Michelle Obama has made this one of her number one campaigns, which is addressing childhood obes obesity. Uh, we're making some inroads, it sounds like, in some of these efforts. Uh, people are becoming more aware. What do you see on the horizon for the childhood obesity issue? You know, it really looks like some of the education that we're doing, um, intervention for uh, parents' education, for child education, um, increase in physical activity, better educational materials with the change of my pyramid to my plate, which is uh, you know, more universally understandable tool um, that we have seen recently a slight drop in the obesity levels of children. Um, we don't see that same drop for adults, but maybe this generation will try to change the tides. And I think what we found is that if we catch this early, it's obviously better than waiting until it develops until the kids are teenagers. Absolutely. We know that nutrition from birth to age five is very important in building patterns and habits throughout life. Okay, and as we move along here in the interview, I want to ask you about junk food and uh, the problems that we have with junk food in society today. And it's the fact that with junk food, you get lots of calories, but not very much nutrition. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, that's absolutely true. Junk food is everywhere. It has great advertising. I don't remember the last time I saw a great commercial for broccoli, but there's plenty of commercials for junk food out there. Um, and yes, they're really high in calories, high in salt and preservatives, and very low in nutrition value, meaning that it only provides energy, no protein, no vitamins and minerals. And the body has mechanisms to adjust to a lack of proper nutrition. What are some of those mechanisms that will kick in if someone spends too much time indulging in junk food? Well, our body is made to, in times of need, store energy. Uh, and when we eat lots of junk food, our body really no longer says, I need storage of glycogen to run. I'm never going to go be physically active. I have plenty of food available, so I'm just going to store a lot of it as fat. I'm going to really slow down the metabolism because this person doesn't seem like they're going to get up and do anything today. As we talk about obesity and issues of that nature, which are referred to as eating disorders, mm -hmm. we have both ends of the spectrum. You have anorexia and bulimia, which is where there aren't enough calories being retained or restored, and then you have mm -hmm. obesity with too many calories or too much fat storage. What are some of the dimensions of this? We know there's obviously a physical component, but there also has to be a psychological aspect to this as well. How can we address both of those issues? Sure, absolutely. With obesity um, and the other end of the spectrum, bulimia and anorexia, there's usually a psychological issue that sparks the 
the desire to control. So with anorexia and bulimia, often it's controlling food intake by limiting intake. Um, and with obesity, sometimes it's an addiction to the way food makes them feel. Food tastes good, it feels good while you're eating it. And so we can have someone be treated and gain some weight to be in a healthy weight, ra weight range or lose some weight to be down in a healthy weight range. But if we don't address the reasons why, the psychological reasons why the behavior started in the first place, uh, we may not be doing good in the long run. And as a dietitian, you counsel people that have problems with nutrition. Mm -hmm. What's a typical kind of counseling session involve for you? Uh, well, it can really be just so varied. Uh, I don't specialize in eating disorders as far as uh, under eating goes. Um, with overeating, often we talk about the kinds of foods someone eats each day, and you'd be surprised at the number of people who are very overweight who eat just once or twice a day. So it's really education, education about what food and fuel does for your body. When we talk about food and fuel, there are different diets that are available for people today. Some of them are fad diets. Mm -hmm. Some of them have taken on a lot of adherents who swear by them. But uh, just because a diet is popular doesn't necessarily mean it's a good diet. Sure. How do we look through the long list of diets and determine what actually would be a good plan to proceed with? Well, the reality is, is that if any fad diet worked, everyone would do it and we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic. So what we need to do when you look at a diet is think, can I do this forever? Does this really provide fruits and vegetables and protein and, and fiber? Uh, and maybe you need the help of a dietitian for that. And our government tools like the Choose My Plate is a great tool. If you don't see that diet fitting into the Choose My Plate, it's probably not a great choice. All right, I, I, I do have some suggestions from the Nutrition Center, which I've printed out here. This is affiliated with the American Heart Association. And in their guidelines, they mm -hmm. suggest that the average person, the average adult consuming 2,000 calories a day should do the following. They should consume, in terms of fruits and vegetables, at least four and a half cups a day. Does that sound about right? It does. Okay. Fish, preferably oily fish. This would be something like salmon or sardines in that category. Mm -hmm. At least two, three and a half ounce servings a week. Absolutely. Uh, Fiber-rich whole grains, at least three one ounce equivalent servings a day, about right? Yes. Okay, and in terms of sodium, we hear a lot about sodium, which is salt. Uh, less than 1,500 milligrams a day, is that about right? It is, and those guidelines are getting more and more strict, which really means all those foods that come in a bag, a can, or a box um, tend to be high in sodium and should maybe be uh, last on the list. And what's the danger with sodium? Sodium um, has, it leads to high blood pressure, uh, and high blood pressure can lead to you know, extensive heart disease and renal disease, kidney okay. disease, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and in, in terms of sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, these commonly referred to as soda, typically, sure. uh, no more than 450 calories a week, which uh, roughly correlates to about 36 ounces. Right. Um, absolutely. I, I think, you know, really, we can get less than that. There's no need for sugar sweetened beverages in the diet, but if we stay at that limit or less, we can kind of ensure that we're not exceeding our calorie needs. Okay, and uh, another diet fad or trend that has developed recently is what's referred to as the paleo diet. Mm -hmm. And of course, paleo, for those that aren't familiar with it, refers to paleolithic era of cavemen and so on. And so we essentially eat like a caveman. A caveman right. was known for chasing the buffalo over the cliff or running after a deer with a bow and arrow and eating a lot of wild grains and berries and so on mm -hmm. in the field. Uh, maybe not so much grains because the paleo diet is, is uh, not emphasizing carbo and grain type carbohydrates. Right. What do you think of the paleo diet just from what you've heard? Uh, in general, at, because it emphasizes protein that comes from meat sources, it's going to be high in saturated fat, higher in cholesterol, and too low in fiber um, and other, fi you know, grain foods and other fiber-rich foods like fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do have a, actually another study here that uh, came from the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey. Mm -hmm. They surveyed over 6,000 people aged 50 and above that took part in the, in the survey. And uh, the results of the survey indicate that high levels of dietary animal protein in people under 65 
uh, those proteins were linked to a fourfold increase in the risk of death from cancer or diabetes mm -hmm. and almost double the risk of dying from any other cause over an 18-year period. And then actually it's the opposite for people over 65. Mm -hmm. They indicated in the study that the over 65 group, a high protein diet cut the risk of death from any cause by 28 percent and reduced cancer deaths by 60 percent according to the details of the study that were published in the journal Cell Metabolism. And they state here that they believe the reason for that in the um, elder group was because uh, people start to lose weight and become frail and uh, the increase in protein helps to boost uh, the ability to stay healthy. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we do know that having too high of protein in your diet leads to things like overweight because of the extra saturated fat, and that can be linked to increased mortality, increased diabetes. Um, and in the older group, we have a natural shift in our body compartment from lean tissue or muscle to fat. And if you eat enough protein and you stay active, you can maintain your lean body mass longer, which can prevent disease or in increase your longevity if a disease does occur. Okay, and so when we have a high protein diet, we have concern about cholesterol mm -hmm. and fat and so on. Sure. What are the dangers of cholesterol and fat? Well, high fat and high cholesterol. Well, fat, because you can eat the least amount of it for the most amount of calories, it's very easy to overeat fat. So when you have foods that have high fat, fat content, it's over easy to overeat calories. Um, and then with cholesterol, we know that high saturated fat and cholesterol in our diet leads to um, hardening of the arteries, heart disease, and then that extra weight you put on can lend itself to diabetes, so increased mortality. Well, let's go back to paleo for just a moment sure. because that is the rage these days. Mm -hmm. um, there is probably some benefit to the paleo diet to someone who's very physically active, like a caveman was. Right. But we don't have too many cavemen in our midst uh, these days, so that's, that's right. probably why it's not all that practical. Right. Um, that's part of it, absolutely. Uh, and if the paleo diet were to emphasize fruits and vegetables and carbohydrate sources from things like fruits and vegetables, even if it de-emphasized whole grains, it would still be healthier than really putting all that emphasis on the protein just the, from meat. Um, it also emphasizes organ meats, uh, and overeating organ meats can lead to you know, toxicity of certain vitamins. So it's really um, a balance. It's all about balance. Okay, and uh, a couple of thoughts before we go to the break. We just have uh, about a minute left. Uh, what about eating vegetables from the farmer's market or fresh picked from the garden? Why do they taste so much better than something that's been in the refri refrigerator for about a week? Well, the minute we pick a fruit or a vegetable off of its you know, growing vine, we, uh, it immediately starts losing its nutritional content. So when we go to the store and that's been on the shelf for a few days and then we put it in the fridge for a few days, by the time we eat it, the nutrition content is lower and the taste can definitely be uh, compromised. So when you go to a farmer's market or you're able to pick something off of your own garden, that taste is you know, very fresh and just a, you know, maybe a day or two from being picked. Okay, we have to take a break now. We will be back in a moment, and when we do come back, we'll go through a, sort of a veritable laundry list of items regarding diet and nutrition terms you've heard before, and we'll get Emily's take on all of them. Stay with us. There's a world of opportunity available through the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Does your career involve legal work, law enforcement, fraud investigation, or crime scene analysis? You can increase your skill level and enhance your career by enrolling in the Basic Applied Forensic Science and Crime Analysis Certificate Program. For more information, contact the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Emily Haynes. We're talking about diet and nutrition today. And Emily, before we went to the break, I promised the viewers that we would go through a laundry list of uh, various items that are popular terms in the diet and nutrition field. Sure. But before we do that, I just want to go through some other things that relate to uh, health and healthy eating, in particular the amount of calories one should uh, consume on a daily basis. Okay. There is a formula that uh, we have that uh, takes the number of pounds a person weighs and divides by 2.2 to come up with kilograms, mm -hmm. which is the measurement that we go by. Sure. We take kilograms and multiply that 
uh, times 20 to 25 to get the proper calorie intake. Yes. So if we have a 150 pound person, mm -hmm. someone whose normal weight is 150 pounds, divided by 2.2, that's 68 kilograms. 68 kilograms times that formula means about 1,400 calories on the low end, 1,700 calories on the high end. Mm -hmm. And that should be adequate nutrition to give someone the kind of energy they need. Right, absolutely, and that would be for weight maintenance. If that person wanted to gain or lose weight, that number would change. Or if they were very physically active, maybe it would change. And why is that range the appropriate range? How do they come up with that kind of well, we've done studies of people who are able to maintain a healthy weight, um, and when we look at the evidence and how many calories they eat, and people who naturally maintain their weight, they are usually eating between 20, 20 and 25 calories per kilogram of their body weight. Okay, and as that correlates with the body mass index, what is the BMI? Okay, BMI, body mass index, is really just a ratio. It's a way for us to compare your height with your weight, and as we know, if your weight is very high and your height is not, that comparison gives us a larger number. And the larger your BMI, the higher risk category you are for chronic disease. Okay, and so what's a good BMI? Okay, so a healthy, normal BMI is considered between 18.5 and 25. Um, when someone is over between 25 and 30, that's considered overweight, and anything over 30 would be considered obese. And if someone, how does someone measure that? Okay, so your BMI is your uh, weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So if you're not great at conversions, you can Google it <laughs> and you would be able to find a calculator very easily to calculate your BMI. Okay, and when we talk about muscle mass, that's a different measurement, but what does that entail? So your muscle mass is the amount of muscle you have in your body compared to your fat mass. Um, and what we like to see is that the muscle mass, of course, is, is higher than your fat mass. Now, if someone has a really high muscle mass, like a bodybuilder, their BMI would be, appear to be obese, even though they aren't. So we have to really, you know, this is for the average person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we're looking at muscle mass and exercise and those sorts of combinations of factors with nutrition, mm -hmm. um, what's a good uh, rule of thumb for people to follow if they're starting to exercise a lot more? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, well, in terms of uh, protein intake, for example, you mentioned the bodybuilders. They, right. use, they tend to, uh, they tend to uh, I guess, exaggerate the protein intake at times, in my opinion, but uh, what, what's your opinion on that? Absolutely. The average person could eat one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. So if you did that calculation earlier, our person that was 150 pounds or 68 kilograms should eat 68 grams of protein or less in a day. And that doesn't mean they all come from meat. That means from dairy, from whole grains, from legumes. So one gram a day or less is really you know, what you should shoot for. Bodybuilders really uh, well exceed that, you know, maybe two or three times that amount, and it's not really healthy. Okay, so just because someone is very muscular doesn't mean that that's the kind of diet that you would uh, promote if you knew what they were eating. Absolutely, right. Okay, and is it, uh, not to pick on the bodybuilders if we happen to have any of them in the viewership here, but uh, in terms of exercise and resistance training, what kinds of things should people be looking at to maintain health and bone density and so on? Sure. So when someone exercises, they just want to make sure that they're doing something cardiovascular. That means get your heart pumping a little bit, okay? Um, and then in order to maintain your muscle mass, you want to do at least three exercises that get your major muscle groups. And those are your legs, your abdominal area, and your arms, okay? Maybe your back. And you want to do that at least a couple of times a week. And maybe we should talk about sleep as well. We need to have adequate sleep in order for digestion to happen appropriately and metabolism to, to work the way that it should. Sure, and we do know, so adequate sleep is very important and uh, our stress hormones are, in, are elevated when we don't sleep enough and stress hormones can actually add to our fat accumulation. So sleep's really important um, and people who exercise and people who eat right tend to sleep better. Okay. 
Well, I promised we'd go through a long list of items okay. that uh, we hear about when we read about diet, nutrition, and so on. So let's go through these, and I want to get your response. Okay. We read a lot about high fructose corn sugar sweetener mm -hmm. or corn syrup sweetener. What are your thoughts about that? You know, studies are inconclusive at this point as to whether or not high fructose corn syrup actually has the terrible health side effects that we think it does. The reality is that the kinds of foods that have high fructose corn syrup added are the foods that we should be eating less of anyways. So a lot of studies use high amounts in beverages. Well, we really shouldn't be drinking that large amounts of sugar sweetened beverages anyways. Okay, let's talk about gluten and wheat products because okay. gluten comes from wheat. Uh, there's been an anti-gluten fad of late. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people have picked up on this and there is a correlation between gluten, wheat, and celiac disease. Sure. What should we be concerned with in terms of gluten and uh, its possible uh, implications with uh, celiac disease? Um, I think that anyone who's having severe GI problems, you know, when you eat certain foods, you're experiencing side effects, you should seek medical attention. There are tests that we can do to determine whether or not you have a gluten allergy. Um, if you feel like low energy, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a gluten allergy. You could be overeating, there could be something else. Fewer than 2% of adults have a true food allergy, so it's very unlikely that the number of people who are trying to cut gluten out of their diet are doing so appropriately. Okay, so in other words, there might be some hysteria out there about gluten at this time. That's what I'm gathering from what you're saying. Yeah, I think there is. And as you said, not everyone, uh, or not everyone, actually very few people have a food allergy, but mm -hmm. that also means, from what I understand in our previous conversation, that eating a lot of gluten will not necessarily cause you to develop an allergy toward it or a resistance toward it. Is that Absolutely correct? Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, when you consider the number of people that, again, we do have 50% of our population that's overweight or obese, many of those people are consuming lots of gluten products and their side effect isn't that they're having GI distress, it's weight gain. So I think that what we see is that when you cut any food group out of your diet, like all grain products, it decreases your calorie intake. So of course you lose weight. Right. Okay, what about uh, omega-3 fatty acids? Omega-3 fatty acids are, we know, um, great for our heart health. They help to decrease our bad cholesterol. Um, what, why omega-3s get all the glory? Because we need omega-3s and omega-6, which are two different fats that are precursors for hormones and metabolic pathways in our body. But omega-3 is the fat that we don't get enough of. We get enough um, omega-6 because it's in vegetable products and we tend to eat enough vegetable oils. Omega-3s are found in nuts and fatty fishes. Um, and again, it's the one we tend to not get enough of in our diet, and it's why there's such an emphasis on making sure you try to include those foods. So you mentioned omega-3 and omega-6. Mm -hmm. Omega-6 is found in the vegetable products. Right. And uh, when we eat breakfast cereals and they say omega-6 or omega-3, what do those, what products do we find those in? So if you see an omega-3, it's probably um, got a flax component or some sort of walnut or almonds, um, or it's just uh, added after the fact. So it might be a fortified cereal. Um, if you want omega-3s, you know, in their own right, again, choosing things like flax, fatty fishes, and nuts. Okay, vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. What kinds of vegetable oils are good for cooking? And what about for things like salad dressing? Okay, so uh, using olive oil and vegetable oil or canola oil are all fine. They're, they have the same fat content. Olive oil has more omega-3s. Um, and, you know, it's great for using for salad dressings. You can use it in some cooking, but it doesn't translate well because it has its own flavor to certain items. So if you're baking and you can use vegetable oil, you might not want to use veg uh, olive oil. It might not have the same, the same flavor. Okay, what about meats? Uh, lean meats, is that understood? Absolutely. So choosing leaner cuts of red meat and doing that less often. Um, you know, fish is great, using chicken, removing the skin. Um, and again, we emphasize protein from meat in our culture, uh, but you really could go days without eating meat and still meet your protein needs. Okay, and speaking of protein, what about dairy products and probiotics? Great, uh, you know, in order for us to maintain our 
kind of GI or gut health, uh, probiotics can really help the natural bacteria that helps us to digest fibers. Uh, and yogurt is a great source of probiotics. Uh, we don't have to get any special kind of yogurt. Any yogurt really is gonna promote the healthy growth of the normal bacteria in your intestines. Okay, what about organic foods versus non-organic foods? I think that, that organic foods have a future. Uh, right now, we don't have great um, laws about what organic means and how organic needs to be grown. So when we buy an organic food, we often think, oh, this is pesticide free, but it may have been grown right next to a field where there were pesticides and there's cross contamination. So unfortunately, studies show that um, many, many of the foods that are labeled as organic have contamination from pesticides. Right, and that's just, as you said, a, a, a problem of proximity right. of fields being close together. Mm -hmm. What about fiber? What's appropriate intake of fiber? 25 to 35 grams a day for adults. So if you looked at a whole wheat piece of bread, that's gonna have between three and five grams a day. So if you're eating whole grain products and fruits and vegetables, it's an easily attainable number, but the minimum of 25. Okay, vitamin C and antioxidants. Mm -hmm. What should we do? Okay, um, eat fruits and vegetables. Yeah, uh, you can supplement, but we don't see the same results with supplements. We don't know that our bodies really take supplements and do with them what they do with food. So making sure that we have ample fruits and vegetable sources of vitamin C and other antioxidants is really the way to go. Okay, Emily, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to take us on a shopping trip through your favorite grocery store. Okay. What aisles should we avoid? What should we look for? And what should we emphasize in this shopping trip? 30 seconds. All right, you're gonna walk in the door and you're gonna walk all the way around the perimeter because that's where you're gonna find the fruits and vegetables, the fresh meats, the dairy. You're gonna look for fresh seasonal vegetables and fruits that are on sale so that you can watch your pocketbook. Um, and then if you wanna slip through the middle where the frozen section is, you can get you know, the flash frozen fruits and vegetables to put in your smoothie or when you need a break from, you know, uh, prep. Um, and that's, you know, really what you want to do. You might want to go through the whole grain aisle as well, but um, you're going to avoid, you know, 90% of the actual aisles in the grocery store. Well, thank you. I'm going to try that next time I go to the grocery store. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It was great to be here. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us again for another episode soon. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.